Hi everybody, uh, Happy New Year. Really looking forward to getting to chat with you tonight. Um, so we got a little bit of a word map here up on the screen to kind of kick us off. Um, it's going to go over a few of the topics that I hope you will take away with you at the end of our time together this evening. Um, so for us as astronomers, one of the most important features of the universe are galaxies, something we are, have great interest in. Um, and for me in particular, and a lot of my colleagues, we study galaxies in the same way that archaeologists study history, and I'm going to teach you a little bit about that today, and try and convince you that one of the most substantial events experienced by our galaxy, the Milky Way, was a major collision with another galaxy billions of years ago. So I want to start off by showing you these two images. These images are called the Hubble Deep Fields, taken by the Hubble Space Telescope back in the 1990s. Really interesting idea here. The telescope was tasked with staring at a supposedly empty patch of space, two of them, one on the left, one on the right, for over a week each. And staring at a spe specific patch of space for a week allows you to collect as much light as possible, see the faintest objects, and they did not expect to find anything here. But in fact, what they found was thousands of little bright points and these most of these bright points are oh there we go are galaxies i can count the number of stars in our own galaxy in these images on two hands the rest of what you see here are galaxies and we'll see hubble again tonight these little things in the top corner these are not empty space voids they're just the way the telescope works but we could sit here and, and do an entire hour pondering kind of the deeper philosophical significance of these pictures and how much they reveal our universe contains. But for us, as astronomers interested in galaxies, it reveals to us that on the broadest scales of the universe, the fundamental building blocks are galaxies themselves. Much near to us in kind of our own backyard, we see more galaxies, and this confirms that statement I made a few seconds ago. And furthermore, we see that galaxies have a wide range of colors, shapes, sizes, morphologies. They've got tons of stuff going on. And one of our primary quests is to figure out why they do what they do and help try and come up with theories to explain these things. But before we get into galaxies, I want to rewind a little bit and talk a little bit about the Big Bang. The Big Bang, this, what you're seeing here is you can think of it like a timeline with time moving from left to right present day being here on the right. At the beginning of the universe, around the time of the Big Bang, there were quantum fluctuations imparted on the matter density field of the universe. Now, if you were here back in December, you might have learned a little bit about that by a fellow grad student of mine who spoke uh, at, mu at much greater length about these things. But for us, astronomers who are interested in galaxies, we are content with the idea that these quantum fluctuations lead to regions of space which are slightly a little more dense, a little more stuff there, and regions of space with less stuff in them. And those regions of space with more stuff will gravitationally collapse to form galaxies that we see today and throughout the universe. This is a diagram you may have seen before if you've been to these uh, Astro Tours talks before. This is the cosmic pie chart of ignorance. It shows the sort of total amount of stuff in the universe and about 70% of that is something we have no idea what it is, we only kind of know what it does called dark energy. About 30% of it is matter and by matter we mean stuff that exudes gravity on the universe. But of that 30%, about 80% is dark matter that we only know does gravity, we have no idea what it is. So some massive fraction of this pie chart here, we have absolutely no idea what it is, we only kind of know what it does. Um, but for us, again, as people interested in galaxies, we like the matter part. We, we sort of notice the dark energy part, but we kind of ignore it a little bit. It's not super important for what we're interested in. And of the matter component, there's the dark matter, which will become important. We'll talk about that. And then the regular matter. This is baryons, as we call them. I may use that word. But this is galaxies, gas, planets, stars, everything that we're familiar with of our day-to-day -day existence. So this is an image taken from a simulation of the universe. So this is fake here. But what we do is we put a bunch of laws of physics into a computer, get a big bang going, and then we produce whole universes that look like this. What you're seeing here is dark matter. The bright parts is where there's lots of dark matter. The dark parts is where there's less dark matter. And 
dark matter, what you can see here is it, it exists in a sort of hierarchy. We like to use the word hierarchy here in astronomy. What does that mean? It means there are many fewer s large things than there are small things. There's a vastly larger number of small things in the universe when it comes to dark matter. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about normal matter in a second. These objects, these dark matter objects, these spherical globules, these blobs that you're seeing throughout this image, we call these halos. These are dark matter halos among the fundamental units of the universe. But matter is not only hierarchical um, in terms of dark matter, it's also hierarchical in terms of the baryonic component. So here you're seeing a zoom in of a simulation like what you just saw with the dark matter on the left. And you can see that where there's a lot of dark matter, there's also a lot of stars. And so what we say is in astronomy, dark matter halos host luminous galaxies. They are the sort of gravitational seas that drag in a bunch of stars and gas and dust to create the galaxies that we see scattered throughout our universe that we saw in those amazing Hubble images. Now, not only are, does the dark matter host the galaxies, but you can also see that the galaxy component is quote unquote hierarchical as well, meaning there's many, many more of these small objects around, oh, around each big object in the same way that there's many more small dark matter halos around large dark matter halos. And this is reflected when we look out in our very, very closest backyard. This is called the local group. Here's the Milky Way here, and this is our closest large neighbor, the galaxy Andromeda. You may have seen it in the night sky. Around Milky Way and Andromeda is a whole host of smaller galaxies. We call these dwarf galaxies, and they range in size from almost as large as either the two big players, the Milky Way and Andromeda, all the way to very, very small systems of stars, only containing a few thousand stars total. So again, this is reinforcing the idea that there is always a spectrum of objects of different sizes, and there's more small objects, galaxies in the universe, than there are big ones. Now, in our universe, galaxies move around. There's a lot of them. They often crash into one another, and these are monumental events in the lifespan of a single galaxy. Um, but it's the case that it's actually more likely for any one large galaxy like our Milky Way, to crash into another smaller galaxy simply because there's so many more smaller galaxies than there are other big galaxies. So here, back in the simulation that we see, these two large galaxies here are much more likely to experience a collision with the small dwarf galaxies that exist in their vicinity than they are with each other. So consolidating these ideas in the broad scheme of things, we tend to think about the formation of galaxies in the context of merger events, collisions between smaller objects to create larger ones. And this sch schematic here sort of illustrates that point. If you think here being uh, representative of the early universe, get smaller little galaxies, what we call dwarf galaxies, will merge together to form slightly larger galaxies, which can merge together to form even larger galaxies finally into galaxies like our Milky Way. This is not the only way that galaxies can grow and accumulate mass and gas and stars and dark matter, but it's one of the principal ways that they do this. So let's go into a bit of an explainer about what happens in a specific galaxy collision. Imagine here if we have a galaxy like our Milky Way and a smaller galaxy here that's going to come crash into it. It's going to come in on a nearby trajectory. What's going to happen is the gravity of this host galaxy, like the Milky Way, is going to gravitationally tear apart this galaxy that's coming in on a nearby pass. The stars are actually going to continue on pretty much the same orbit they came in on. The gas, though, is going to crash into the gas that exists in our Milky Way, and it's going to get sucked right into the center but we're gonna be left with a big cloud of stars that kind of surrounds the host galaxy after this collision has elapsed billions of years later. 
And that big cloud of stars is one of the relics that we can go and investigate today that reveals to us the presence of historic collisions between other galaxies and between the Milky Way and some of the galaxies in its vicinity. So let's put all these ideas that we've worked on together here. And I want to show you this video, which it will Okay, so what you're watching here is, again, a simulation of how the universe works. You're watching galaxies moving around. These are stars that you're seeing and gas, and you're going to watch them evolve. We kind of started the movie kind of like at the beginning of the universe or a very early time in the universe. And you're going to watch these galaxies collide together and change how they shape and look in the process. And I want you to pay attention to what happens to a galaxy when it crashes into another one. It really changes things. Otherwise, galaxies like this one in the bottom corner here are pretty much content to just go about their day. It's the collisions that really change a galaxy and can turn it into something quite more than it once was. See, look at that. So the end of this video here, now we are left after all these collisions with a galaxy sort of like what our Milky Way might look like today. But it's experienced all of this upheaval through these collisions and that causes it in large part to look like how it does at the end of the video. And we're gonna go into that sort of thing throughout the rest of the talk here. So let's really ground ourselves here and focus on the Milky Way, which is our home galaxy. This is an image of the Milky Way that you could take yourself, seen from Earth. Uh, if you've ever been to somewhere with very dark skies, you may have seen the Milky Way. It's like a very bright band of stars that kind of arcs across the sky. And we see it as a bright band of stars across the sky because we're inside the Milky Way. So we see it as, as, it, as it is from the inside out. Now this is sort of what the Milky Way looks like, and the Milky Way is a very typical spiral galaxy. And we, which is the sun here, we exist in the sort of suburbs of the Milky Way. The Milky Way is a very typical galaxy, and we exist in the suburbs, not out in the outskirts where the crazy stars live, and not in, in the inner parts where the other crazy stars live. Very normal, we are a Toyota driving, spaghetti on Wednesday type of star in a in a Toyota driving kind of galaxy. Okay, so if we look down on a galaxy like our Milky Way, this is not a real picture, this is just an artist's interpretation of what our galaxy probably looks like. We see if we look down on it face down, so kind of from the top looking down, we see these beautiful spiral arms, we see in the center this kind of central spherical almost region called the bulge, but it's slightly elongated and when it does that we call it a bar. We're kind of part way out. If we then shifted our view and looked at it what we call edge on we see again that we're kind of part way out to the outskirts of our galaxy the bulge is a sort of spherical region the disk is this kind of flat plane of stuff there's a lot of gas in there and there's a lot of stars and in particular when a star is born in our own galaxy it's going to exist in its life in the disk we were born in this galaxy and therefore we exist in the disk right here but surrounding each galaxy, you may not be able to pick it up because the contrast is not the greatest, um, is what we call the stellar halo. This is what we just chatted about a few slides back when we talked about what happens when a specific galaxy might collide with another. These are remnant stars from ancient collisions, things that have crashed into us. They've left their stars in this big cloud around us while the gas ends up down in the disk of our galaxy where the other stars are. Okay, so in astronomy, and for me in particular and a lot of my colleagues, our goal is to determine how the Milky Way got to where it is today. Why does it look like how it does? And how can we use those insights of studying our Milky Way to learn more about the broader population of galaxies throughout our universe? But there's a few problems with this. 
One is that we cannot obviously see things that happened in the past. If something hit us long ago or something important happened to the Milky Way in the past, we cannot, we have no way to access that information um, directly. Another problem is if we say, well, if it happened to the Milky Way in the past, it'll probably happen in the future. Let's just wait and be patient. That's also not really that feasible because the Milky Way is very, very close to being frozen in time. Then this is, you know, sort of has to do with astronomy as a whole. Things happen on the time scales of millions, if not billions of years. And so even if we go back to the earliest people that lived on planet Earth like a million years ago, the Milky Way would still basically look the exact same as it does today. Not much has changed. And so that presents a problem. How are we going to approach this? And this is where this concept of archaeology comes in. We are going to approach studying our galaxy in the same way that an archaeologist would approach studying like an ancient civilization. So what would an archaeologist do? Now, if any of you are archaeologists in the audience, you can come up and I'll give you the mic and you can explain it. But I'm going to go to go. I've watched Indiana Jones. So what I might do is I might come along and say, ooh, something went on here. Um, I'm going to go find like a pot and like a trinket and like maybe a building outline or something. And I'm going to figure out what it's made of. I'm going to figure out how deep it is in the dirt and assume that that has to do with kind of how long ago this thing was left there and do all these sorts of things. And I'm going to try and piece together an understanding of something that happened very long ago with these very indirect tools. So taking that approach, how are we going to study the Milky Way? Well, the first thing we're going to do is focus on all these individual structures. If you're thinking back to that video that I showed, and it'll come back, don't worry. Um, lots of different features of our galaxy, the stellar halo, the disk, the spiral arms, all these sorts of things. Galaxies change how they look through time as they experience collisions and grow and experience different events throughout their lifetime. So we're going to focus on the different components of the galaxy and to try and learn a little bit about how it once was and how it will be in the future. We're also going to focus on the orbits of individual stars. So stars which are born in the Milky Way, these are, you can think of these as like these yellow lines here, they're going to orbit in very nice orderly planar motion. They're going to stay in the disk of the Milky Way. You can imagine it like a pancake and they're going to orbit in such a way that they stay very close to that pancake as they go around experiencing their lives. Our star is one of those. However, stars from the halo, they travel in these big long looping orbits that take them out into this spherical cloud that is the stellar halo. And that tells us something about their origin and how they got there and therefore about things experienced by our galaxy. Another tool we're going to use is the chemical makeup of any one individual star. And this is important because stars are basically like big pressure cookers. Inside, they undergo nuclear fusion. They turn light elements into heavier elements. That powers them. That gives them their energy. But in the process, that transforms those elements essentially forever until another star comes along and does the same thing. So you can imagine a star, perhaps one like our sun, fusing light elements into heavy elements in its core. When stars die, they do it kind of dramatically. They tend to explode. Um, and when they explode, they scatter all of that material that they have enriched, turning from light elements to heavy elements throughout the local little part of the galaxy that they live in. That material, containing more heavy elements than light elements, is going to make its way into the clouds of interstellar gas that will form the next generation of stars. And so as stars are born, die, and born again, they start to contain more and more different kinds of elements, more heavier elements, starting off with basic things like hydrogen and helium, getting all the way up to iron, magnesium, calcium, carbon, oxygen, all these sorts of things that we're used to. But that begs the question, how would we possibly be out? Like, we're not going to go out there with a spoon and take a spoon full of a star and figure out what it's made of. We have to figure it out some other way. So we're going to take starlight with a telescope. We're going to shine it through a prism. And we're going to divide it up into its constituent wavelengths of light, or divide it up into its colors. And when we do that, what we tend to find is that there's little gaps in the spectrum, parts of the spectrum of light coming from one star, which are missing. These are basically like the fingerprints of 
individual atoms. So each individual atom has its own unique fingerprint. By measuring how much light is missing, we infer how much of that element there is in that star. So it tells us each element, iron, hydrogen, helium, carbon, oxygen, all these elements have a unique fingerprint in terms of locations where they cause gaps. And we can piece together how much of the element is in each star by measuring its spectrum. So we're going to go into a little bit of an exercise, kind of how this works. And this is kind of a primer for some of the investigative work we're going to do in a second here. So if I told you here's a plot, and on the x-axis is the amount of iron in a star, and on the y-axis is the ratio of the amount of magnesium to iron. And you may say, I stopped at chemistry 11. It's OK, because I can tell you what exactly these mean. This, on the y-axis, you can think time since the galaxy formed for this individual star. Each point in this diagram is kind of like a star. When there's multiple points on top of each other, you color them by the number of stars that are there. So if you're up here in the plot, you were born when the galaxy was younger as a star. If you're down here, you were born when the galaxy was older. So you're a newer, you're a newer star then. Iron is going to tell us how big the galaxy was when you as a star were born. Less iron means you were born in a smaller galaxy. More iron, you were born in a larger galaxy. So with that in mind, where do you think the Milky Way is in this plot? If I told you these are all stars in the Milky Way, yeah? Uh, I would say it's the middle. The middle. That's pretty good. So this stuff on the right here, the Milky Way is kind of a bigger galaxy. It's bigger than a lot of the other small ones that are existing around it. So these are the Milky Way stars here. And in principle, we have a group up here. These are our younger galaxy stars, i.e. these are actually older. It's a little confusing, but these were born when the galaxy was younger. So this is our older generation and our younger generation of star, born when the galaxy was older. These over here are our stellar halo stars. Came into our galaxy from other smaller objects. They were born in a galaxy which is smaller, and therefore they have less iron in them. Now, we're not going to go into why exactly that happens. You have to come back to another talk to learn about that, and that's going to be next month for you. But these are the sorts of ways that we can investigate galaxies and our own galaxy using these tools. Now, the final thing that we can do is we can actually kind of get a handle on ages of stars sometimes. This can be highly tenuous, though. So we'll come back to this briefly, ages of stars, but just rest for now that as a star changes throughout its life and starts to look different and it'll change its size and how bright it is and other features about it, we can kind of broadly infer how old it is based on that, but it's a very challenging thing to do. Okay, so to summarize the tools we have available as galactic archaeologists, we have the distribution of stars, where does it exist, what does that thing look like, what does the disk look like, are there spiral arms or not, all that kind of stuff. What are the orbits of the stars like? What direction are they going in? How many stars are there going on different orbits? What kind of chemistry do those stars have? Does that like tell us something about the environment in which they were born? And then finally, we can kind of get a handle on ages. Okay, so now we're gonna go out and actually get the data we need to do these archeological investigations. Okay, so we need spectra. In order to get spectra, we are gonna go to this telescope called Apogee stands for the Apache Point Galactic Evolution Experiment. It's a telescope in New Mexico. And pound for pound, this is probably the most scientifically productive telescope on the planet, uh, or in space, actually. I'm going to say this. It's only 2.5 meters, which is kind of pitiful for telescopes. But this thing goes. It's absolutely a total workhorse. It has probably more citations behind it than any other telescope. Um, probably in existence. Maybe Hubble, the Hubble Space Telescope, could compare. Uh, grad students, you're welcome to try and challenge me on that. Um, OK, so what Apogee does, what this telescope does, is among many things, it can take spectra of stars in our galaxy. Here's a map kind of looking at the plane of our galaxy. You can't really see it behind all the colored points. But this is, imagine, looking straight at our galaxy. These are all the locations where we can measure stars. The problem with getting spectra of stars is like a very, it takes a long time to do it. You have to get a telescope to point at a star for kind of a very long time before you get enough light to get this spectrum. So we can't get it for every star we can see. We can only get it for a small number of them, so we kind of choose according to, we get a bunch of scientists in a room and they all fight and then they decide on some hideous looking footprint of where to look at stars. But anyways, 
important tools. OK. So we get spectra using this great telescope called Apogee. OK. The second ingredient we need is we would like, please, a 3D map of the galaxy with also star motions, also please. OK. Now, how are we going to go about getting that? OK. We, we need 3D positions and velocities, velocities, i.e., movement for each star. How are we going to do that? OK. This is where you guys all get to weigh in. This is a multiple choice question. Answer A, are we going to send out super ultra fast space probes to go out and get some sort of three dimensional view of the galaxy or like visit each star and try and come back and report what they saw? That's option A. B, are we going to bounce lasers off each star, bounce a laser, measure its return time and use that to figure out how far away each star is? This is like if you've ever been golfing, this is how your range finder works. This is laser range finding, if you're, if you're familiar with that kind of phenomenon. Are we going to do that? Are we going to measure star positions at different times of year to calculate their distance? Okay. Could we maybe measure the brightness of each star, rely on some knowledge about how bright we think stars are, because we're smart physicists, and calculate distance knowing the fact that stars get fainter as they're further away? Or E, false, James, you're never going to get a PhD. This is absolutely impossible. OK. If you, oh, you're supposed to guess. This is how this is supposed to work. You're supposed to guess. All right, who thinks A? Anybody still think A? Even This could be a double fake here. Now keep that in mind. All right, nobody thinks A. That was wise. Anybody think B? Laser range finding, laser range finding. Laser range finding, maybe. OK, what about C? Star positions. OK, a couple, we've got a couple hands. What about D? Measuring brightnesses. OK, more hands. OK, more hands than C. And what about E? James, never going to get a PhD. <laughs> OK, grad students, I'm going to have a chat with your supervisor after this. OK, well, it's not A. We can't send out super fast space probes. Never going to work. We, we barely have got a space probe traveling at like 15 miles a second to just leave our solar system. This is never going to happen in the life age of the universe unless we develop something cool like warp drives. Okay. Now, what about B? Okay, we could build like a fancy space station. I just started thumbing away at like maybe what a space station that bounces lasers off stuff could look like. Um, it could be kind of a whole group effort thing. No, this will not work. Again, even lasers traveling at the speed of light takes them forever to get anywhere else, and they don't bounce off stars. Lasers don't work like that. This is not going to work either. And I'm sorry, but you doubters, E is also <laughs> wrong. And D is wrong, unfortunately. This is kind of a sketchy thing to do. This is, it's possible. It was a good guess. And any grad students who picked this, I'm going to also have a talk with your supervisor, because you should know better. But we're going to go with actually option C here. Let me show you how that works. So imagine here this is the Earth as it kind of goes around the sun. Obviously not to scale in a little squash, but here's the sun, here's the Earth. Here's a star. We're interested in learning how far away this star is from us. Here's a bunch of like background stars. Imagine these things are just like way far away. Okay, well when we look, when the Earth is in, in January and we look at this one star, we see it lying in this position among these background stars. Swoop around to July, six months later, the Earth is on the other side of the sun. Look, the star's position appears to have shifted. This is the phenomenon known as parallax. And what this means is that we've created a little right triangle. It's going to get mathy. And what we have here are the ingredients of a right triangle. We've got this angle. We just measured that. That's from our images we took in January and July. The distance between the Earth and the Sun, we know this. We can just go out into the solar system and measure this quite easily. And using a little Sokotoa action, we get the distance to the star, which is what we want to know. And the trick is, if you are making precise enough telescope measurements to see these little shifts that we just showed you between um, six month durations, you're also making accurate enough measurements to figure out how fast a star and in what direction it's going through three-dimensional space. So using these measurement techniques, we get our six-dimensional map, and it tells us where the stars are and how fast they're going. OK, this is where the hero of the story comes in, who's the Gaia Space Telescope. 
So Gaia was launched in December of 2013 from the Southern Hemisphere. And about a month later, Gaia arrived at the location where it still sits today. It's out beyond the moon. Um, and it sits there and measures parallaxes of stars. Uh, it measures how far away they are from us. And what enables Gaia what enables Gaia to do that is the fact that it sits out in space quite far away from Earth, beyond the moon, and it sits there and it rotates in a circle and it processes so it can map out the entire galaxy. Gaia is actually made of two telescopes and this allows it to make those parallax measurements as it goes all the way around the sun with the Earth very accurately by looking at two different parts of the sky at the same time. And it creates this 3D map where it measures carefully the positions of each star, waits six months, measures them again, and does that year on, year out to very accurately get the distance to stars and how fast they're moving. So to give you an idea of how accurate Gaia is in doing what it does, Gaia, if it were located here in Toronto, the precision with which it can measure the shift, those little shifts in stars that we see as Earth moves from January to July or through every, any six month period as it moves from one side of the sun to the other, the precision with which it makes those measurements is equivalent to it measuring something the width of a single human hair located in Halifax if we put it in Toronto. So just incredibly accurately it can measure the positions of stars. This is no easy task. So what Gaia has done is basically every single star it can see in the night sky, which is not all of them, some of them are too faint, it's created a 3D map of the galaxy using those stars, and it can tell you for each of those stars which direction and how fast they're moving. And using that information, here's a cool little diagram that shows the 40,000 closest stars to us seen from Earth looking at the galaxy and the trajectory they will take over the next two million years. And we fast forward this for you so that you can see it, but this is two million years of stellar motion that we know these stars will take. Now, keep in mind, this is only 40,000 stars. This is like two thousandths of a percent of all the data in Gaia. It's a truly phenomenal telescope that's created a truly phenomenal map of the galaxy. Now the question is, what has it discovered? Well, Gaia has discovered a secret, something that's really revolutionized our idea of the galaxy. Here what you're seeing are stars close to, the, close to, the, to our sun. And on the y-axis of each of these panels, I'm plotting how fast they're moving around the galaxy. And on the x-axis, I'm plotting how fast they're moving either towards the galaxy, that's negative values in each of the panels, or away from the galaxy. Like sometimes they're just on lazy orbits that move in and a little out from the center of the galaxy. They're not leaving or anything like that. Each of these panels show different stars with different amounts of iron. And if you recall, stars with more iron, probably born in our galaxy. Stars with less iron, probably not born in our galaxy from smaller other galaxies. So this is the disk of the Milky Way. This is where we live. The fact that it has positive rotational velocity means that we're all moving around the Milky Way together. And here at the lowest amounts of iron is the stellar halo. This is, as we said, stuff that's crashed into us, small little galaxies that have crashed into us. They're moving in a mixture of in and out orbits and around orbits. They're kind of doing whatever they want. But look, this group of stars are moving more in in and out orbits, the extent of this group is more in and out than it is around the galaxy. What the heck is that? This is what we've just discovered. This is one of the biggest discoveries of the Gaia telescope, this group of stars here. So just for reference, to give us some context here, these stars are moving in and out from the galaxy. They're on these big, long, loopy orbits that take them from way out in the outer outskirts of the galaxy into the inner galaxy. They're not moving on like more circular orbits around our galaxy in the same way that we are in, our, in, the, in, the, in the sun, in our solar system moving around the galaxy. Okay, so the interpretation of how you get so many stars moving in and out from the galaxy is a head-on collision 
with another galaxy. So what happened is another galaxy, probably a smaller one, came and hit us. And then billions of years later, the stars which were in that galaxy, think back to when we kind of went over what happens when two galaxies hit, are sitting in a big cloud of stars around us, but they tend to be moving more in and out than kind of in around orbits, if that makes sense. So when did this collision occur? Was it yesterday? Was it way, way, way long ago? Well, here what we're doing is we're gonna look at a bunch of stars, and remember I said that ages are a little weird, a little sketchy, but these very smart astronomers, including one astronomer who used to work here at the University of Toronto, measured the age in billions of years for a bunch of stars as a function of how much are they on radial orbits. Up here, very radial, like these are the in and out stars. Down here, these are the normal stars. And then we've got amount of iron as the color, but we're gonna ignore iron for now. You can see this group of stars, these are our in and out stars that we're interested in here. These are the ones from this head-on collision. And you can see they were all born about 10 billion years ago. So this collision probably happened right as soon as the last one of them was born, sort of eight to 10 billion years ago. So if we were to rewind the clock, this is kind of maybe what this collision would have looked like. A smaller galaxy like this, colliding with a larger galaxy that sort of looks like the Milky Way. Just for reference, this is not an artist's interpretation. This is a real pair of galaxies out there in the cosmos, but we're just showing you kind of an example of what this might have looked like so many billions of years ago. All right. Now the question is, this thing that hit us, we love names in astronomy, we're the best at names. What is it called? All right, it was co-discovered by two groups of researchers. One group of Dutch researchers and one group of British researchers, okay? And they basically had to share naming rights. The Dutch researchers, they went with the name Enceladus. So Enceladus in Greek mythology is one of the, the giants. These are the children of the Titans and they're killed by the classic Olympian Greek gods. Here is Athena destroying Enceladus the giant Enceladus is also the, the child of the Titan Gaia. So, you know, it's all like kind of very poetic, you know, it's a galaxy that got destroyed when it hit a bigger galaxy named after any of it. Anyways, it's all very good. Okay, awesome name, great. So we call this Enceladus? No, the British came along and they said, how about the sausage? And now why do they call it the sausage? They call it the sausage because look, these group of stars is like a very long, distribution of stuff. It's a sausage. So they were just like simplicity. It's the direction to go. None of this poetic Greek crap, just sausage. Okay. And a British one, right? They could have gone with something else. They, just, they could have gone being the spaghetti noodle, but it wasn't. It was the sausage because they're British. Okay. Very good. And I'm not kidding here. Like when I write papers, this thing for me is Gaia sausage slash Enceladus. I have to call it that. So for now on, we're going to call it GSE. I'm going to call it GSE from now on. Okay. Why was this thing important? Okay, why do we care that some galaxy hit us a gazillion years ago? Okay, we're going back to that video that I showed earlier. Here is the galaxy collisions forming that galaxy like the Milky Way and the simulations that I showed. And just pay attention to what happens when these galaxies, when they crash into each other. Pay attention how the galaxies change. So in particular, a few of the really crucial things that Gaia Enceladus did to our galaxy. One is that it probably provided a lot of the dark matter and gas that currently exists in our galaxy. So looking out at you today, some of you guys are undoubtedly made of material that was once in the sausage. I'm sorry to tell you that, but in the sausage, you're probably me too. Don't worry, I'm not immune because a lot of the gas that came into our galaxy before our sun was even created came from Gaia Enceladus. It gave some stars to the galaxy too, not that many, the ones that are out in the halo in this kind of diffuse cloud. It also probably created the spiral arms and the bar of our galaxy. Look at the collision, see how the collision, watch this, watch how the spiral, it's gonna create some spiral arms, watch them get made. See, them, see the spiral arms emerging there? So it's likely actually that our galaxy did not have spiral arms before the collision with Gaia Enceladus. 
and finally it initiated the second big generation of star formation in our galaxy that we pointed out earlier on when we looked at the um, magnesium and iron in stars and we are part of that second generation of stars so while Gaia Enceladus did not cause us directly to, to form our Sun it probably kind of started a generational event of star formation which eventually included us okay my research here at the University of Toronto is to try and figure out more about this properties of this thing before it hit us in an effort to learn what it might have done to our galaxy one of the biggest problems that we face is incompleteness in our data. So Gaia Enceladus is probably consists of like 100 million stars. We'd like to know where those stars are and how many of them there are and whatnot. But combining Gaia, which has a lot of stars that can look at it, but Apogee is kind of the limiting factor. We only have about 450,000 stars because Apogee just can't do that much. Remember the kind of incomplete bickering nonsense. So anyways, there is a lot of stars we don't see that we need to infer their presence based on the data we do have. This is a really challenging problem to solve. We put a lot of time into creating very clever statistical models that try and account for things so that we can get at the nature of what Gaia Enceladus was like as its remnant exists around our galaxy today. So one of the other things I do is I use statistical models to kind of make fake groups of Gaia Enceladus stars and compare them to real data. So here's real data. This is, again, the same axes that you saw before, rotation around the galaxy, and this is energy versus movement around the galaxy. Energy, think of it like speed plus how far away you are from the galaxy, just another way of describing orbits. Colored by iron, this is real data. You can see all the disk stars are these kind of like higher iron stars, and then the halo stuff, and it's kind of elongated, that's Gaia Enceladus. Here in energy, it's kind of flipped. So this is Gaia Enceladus here, and this is our Milky Way. This is the fake galaxy we make, and this is where the disk stars would lie, just we don't include them, just so they don't get kind of blown out um, and distract. But we just show a contour for where they would be, and this like, nice fake galaxy. And this really helps us to try and bridge the gap between our incomplete data and the underlying reality as we use these statistical models to try and bridge that gap there with regards to completeness. One of the other things that I've worked a lot on is trying to help other scientists figure out how to pick Gaia Enceladus stars based on how the stars are orbiting. So here, again, the two same quantities, energy and motions around the galaxy and in and out from the galaxy. Here instead, I'm coloring by how confident I am that the stars at each little point here are actual members of Gaia Enceladus. We can figure this out using these statistical techniques. And then we then report to other astronomers where it's very likely that they are going to go find stars that are from Gaia Enceladus based on how the stars are orbiting, which gives you these axes labels. Kind of combining all of these lines of analysis together, one of the things that we're able to do is make a confident claim about how big Gaia Enceladus was before it hit us. A lot of astronomers actually think it was a very large galaxy and that the, the ratio between kind of how big Gaia Enceladus was and how big the Milky Way was at the time they collided was closer than you might imagine. So maybe Gaia Enceladus was half the size of the Milky Way. What my research, which is very carefully taking into account a lot of different effects, has shown is it's actually likelier that Gaia Enceladus was a bit of a smaller galaxy, interestingly enough. And that's forced us to kind of have to reevaluate a lot of our theories about what we can say Gaia Enceladus was responsible for and what it wasn't responsible for and how the collision took place. Furthermore, we're able to say exactly kind of where in the three-dimensional space of the Milky Way the Gaia Enceladus starts here. You can't really see it because the projector the contrast isn't good enough, but Gaia Enceladus is kind of shaped like a football. You may see the dull little outline here, but it's kind of an inclined football. If we're here in the Milky Way and we're staring in towards the center, which is how this view is shown, it's kind of on an angle like this, so that one end is high above the Milky Way and the other end is kind of low below the Milky Way. So the geometry of how Gaia Enceladus looks today, the distribution of where the stars from this collision are, tells us about the angle that the galaxy hit us from in the first place. A final thing that I do 
is I use a, sim a set of simulations called Illustrious TNG. S uh, Star Trek fans in the audience, it's number two of the Illustrious simulations. It's the uh, Picard of Illustrious simulations. We go in there and what we do is we find galaxies that look a lot like our Milky Way. They have, I'm sorry to say use this word again, but a sausage. They have a sausage. We're looking for galaxies with sausages. Big groups of stars on very radial orbits existing in the stellar halo. And we go and we ask the question, what happened to those galaxies? Were they hit by something on a head-on trajectory? And typically we're finding actually that the answer is yes, they were hit by something on a head-on trajectory. And this allows us using these simulations because we can see things happen in great detail and fast forward and rewind it to learn a lot about what happened during the collision and what it did to our galaxy, the Milky Way. Now, looking forward, there is not just groups of stars that we say, this is Gaia Enceladus. Astronomers approach this in gory detail, and what we find is that when we look at stars in the stellar halo, again, this is energy, think speed plus distance, angular momentum, this is a basically rotation around the galaxy. Here's Gaia Enceladus in the very middle, the sausage. There's tons of other groups here that we can discern by the age of the stars, their chemical content and stuff, and we're able to divide things up into these kind of regions representing probably other unique collisions that our Milky Way experienced with other small galaxies that are probably just not as big a deal as Gaia Enceladus, probably a less substantial event. But our real end goal here is to try and come up with some sort of timeline. This is an interesting plot. The top of the timeline is kind of like the early universe and time proceeds going downwards towards the present day. This central line represents the Milky Way and the color is the size of the galaxy, how much stuff there is in it. Each of these lines is like a different big merger event that we now think happened. Um, we have Guy Enceladus. Oh, we've got the Kraken, that's a good one. The Sequoia, the Sagittarius and the Helmi streams, you will not believe who discovered the Helmi streams. It's somebody named Helmi. Um, anyways, so wild names, it's a lot of fun. It's basically coming up with a brand new set of constellations. And our long-term goal as astronomers now is to create basically a chronology of what happened to the Milky Way and how it's been evolving and link these collisions to all these other properties of the Milky Way. Generations of stars as they formed, the creation of spiral arms, parts of the Milky Way like the halo, the bulge, the disk, all these different things, features of the Milky Way. We think, and now strongly believe as an astronomical community, that they're all grounded and driven by collisions. And therefore, we're trying to look kind of back in time and figure out as much as we can about each of these different collisions that have impacted the Milky Way. And my research is really focused on Gaia Enceladus, and in the future we're going to be able to understand similarly more about all these other events that have happened to the galaxy. And so to return us now to our kind of big picture map, we've learned about galaxies and how they're the building blocks of our universe, and how we as astronomers like to approach the science of galaxies and specifically the study of our own Milky Way the same way an archaeologist does. And then I hope I've managed to convince you that one of the most substantial events in the history of our own Milky Way was a collision with another large galaxy and you get to decide if it's the Enceladus or the sausage. I'll leave you with that. Um, okay.